I like this teddy. Does it have some symbolism? The t- oh, a friend of mine gave that to me. <laughs> it actually it initially had a little Bolshevik cap on it as well because I have the a little Budinovka that I used to wear around campus all the time. <laughs> okay, I'll do a little introduction here. <clears throat> Welcome back to the Cosmopod, um, the official podcast of Cosmonaut Magazine, and we are continuing our series our series on actually existing socialism. And we have uh, an author who we're extremely happy to have on, who we've long been a fan of and reviewed one of her books before, um, Helen Yaffa. It's very good, very nice to have you here. Thank you. It's good to be here. Wonderful. And we've got also our man, Mr. Connor. Hey, happy to be here. (laughs) All right. And uh, of course, I'm Christian. um, And we're going to be talking uh, Cuba rather extensively. Um, So we all read uh, Helen's uh, newer book, uh, We Are Cuba, a fantastic, there you go, (laughs) copies out, a fantastic uh, book on uh, Cuba, specifically during and after the uh, special period, um, which is still something that I don't think very many people know about, and this book does a fantastic job going through it. So um, just to begin, the book uh, is, is very dense and it has a lot of information in it, but it's also very, very uh, legible. Um, and there's a, a, um, a really strong connection that you have, Helen, with Cuba, not, not just in an academic sense, but you also were there during the special period. So tell me a little bit about your relationship to Cuba, the island, not just as an academic, but as a, as a person um, and how that affects your uh, scholarship. Okay, um, so thanks for uh, the great set of questions you've sent through and for inviting me onto the, the show. Um, yeah, so as I explain, I think in the intro of my book, um, I uh, grew up with Cuba on my sort of map of, of awareness because I've got um, left-wing parents. And then in um, 1994, So the real peak in the special period, my sister had gone off to Cuba and she went on a two week solidarity brigade and then stayed two extra weeks. And she was actually in Cuba when they had the first and only violent riot uh, since the the revolutionary state seized power in 1959 and um, just just came back, bubbling with what she'd experienced and the um you know contradictions but also the power of community in a sense and so on so um we decided to just you know pick up our mountain bikes pack up our bags and off we went to live in cuba i was 18 at the time Uh, my sister's a couple of years older than me and we just went out to cuba we um got an apartment to stay in we experienced the special period. We experienced the blackouts. We had no water for a couple of days. We had to find plastic bags because when we went to the food market, you know, they would just pour your rice <laughs> onto the floor if you didn't have something ready to con- contain it. We hitched around the entire island. We saw that even with dollars, it was difficult to get supplies. Um, the Cubans were protected by having a ration book Uh, So every neighborhood, every small area in Cuba has on the corner or in the street, it has what they call a bodega, a warehouse which has the ration supplies. So they go there at different intervals and pick up their allocation. Uh, The allocations, the ration book allocation had been massively cut as a result of the special period. Um, But that was one of the mechanisms state controlling distribution which ensured that people didn't starve to death so it was a period uh, it was just amazing to be there to see this period of hardship i was there from 1995 so the economy had started to improve at that point the the um from an economic point of view if you look at the statistics the recovery is remarkably quick Um, and that is even in comparison to seeing what happened in the rest of the former socialist bloc countries that went through a transition to capitalism um, and, you know, also went through in because of that kind of shift in the economy always causes some sort of economic trauma. And Cuba's recovery 
from its own trauma without a transition to capitalism was um, pretty impressive as a comparison. And you can look at the work of um, Emily Morris. She wrote a long article for New Left Review about um, comparing Cuba. I think it's called Exceptional Cuba. So yeah, um, obviously, you know, most people who've been to Cuba are somehow captured. It has a very captivating spirit. There are even books called Captivating Cuba. And we were very much captured by Cuba and Cubans. Um, you know, it's, they're a Caribbean nation, so they have all the characteristics, the cultural characteristics of Caribbean people. But in addition to that, you know, they have an education system, an infrastructure which encourages uh, collectivity, which um, upholds solidarity as the highest expression of humanity and so on. And that does make a difference. That doesn't mean everyone in Cuba is nice and generous and kind, you know, of course. What the biggest lesson on that level that I learned about Cuba is Cuba is a country with people in it. And there are good people and bad people and lazy people and active people and, uh, you know, natural leaders and followers and, and all the rest of it. You know, Cuba, um, I think, I, I even realized when I arrived there, I had built up a whole set of misconceptions about what I would find. And, and that is it, essentially. They are normal people doing extraordinary things. So I think that was it. In terms of my further engagement with Cuba, I then went to university and I set up a, a student society to do activities, to tell people about Cuba, to uh, raise money to buy at that point sound systems and disco equipment and stuff to take out to Cuba. Um, I helped to found a, a, a solidarity movement in Britain called Rock Around the Blockade. It was called Rock Around the Blockade because the purpose was to raise money to buy sound systems, to take out to young people in Cuba. You know, the Cuban um, Young Communist League was, was the one that um, asked this campaign Rock Around the Blockade, if that's what they could focus on. It said, you know, we are putting all of our scarce resources into maintaining health, education, housing, and so on. You know, what we can't afford at this moment, but what we appreciate is really important is access to culture so that young people can have a good time. And the incredible thing is it was happening at the same time as in Britain, the new law had come in called the Criminal Justice Act, which was partly designed to criminalize youth culture that part of the legislation actually said it was illegal to listen to music that was more than 180 beats per minute. So on the one hand, we had the British government criminalizing young people who wanted to go out and party. And on the other hand, we had Cuban uh, authorities and Cuban government saying, help us <laughs> to help to ensure that young people in Cuba can go out and have a good time. So it was an incredible contradiction. And that was um, what happened. I set up this student society. We did, we did nights with hip hop and salsa. We helped to raise money to buy this equipment. And I kept going back to Cuba on solidarity brigades, on the World Festival of Youth and Students in um, 1997, when we arrived in 1997. Um, during, it was during the period we were there. There were four hotel bombs in Havana. This was the period when, um, there was, uh, you know, attempts from the exile community led, masterminded by Luis Posada Carrillis, the infamous, uh, infamous terrorist and ex-operative of the CIA, to uh, target Cuba's nascent burgeoning tourism sector. So on the one hand, you had the attempt from the US government, the establishment, to uh, try and block the sector through the Helms-Burton Act and through um, strengthening the US blockade. And on the other hand, the uh, uh, extremist um, activists in Miami were carrying out terrorism against Cuba. So we were, you know, we went through all that. We went then through the battle of ideas. I was continuing to go back to Cuba. Um, the, all these things, the chapters in my book, right? So I, I kind of lived a little bit of that experience. And, I, and by then, um, the energy revolution, which starts in 2004, 2005, I was living out in Cuba, carrying out my PhD research, which was uh, the book that you guys discussed before, Che Guevara, The Economics of Revolution. And so it's just been constant engagement um, going back to Cuba uh, really frequently. And um, every time I go, my, ex my Cuban family grows, my uh, network of professionals grows. 
Uh, I now know people in BioCuba Pharma because I've written about biotechnology. So I'm finding out about the Cuban vaccines as it happens. And uh, that's it really. I continue to, um, to you know, support the, the solidarity work as well because I think it's important not to just keep it in the realm of uh, a sort of cerebral exercise. I was thinking, so in order to kind of creep up to the special period and talk about it, um, it would be good to briefly kind of overview the economic systems which preceded it. So of course, the, the, the first big one, big debate, the, the, well, the great debate as it's called is, uh, you know, uh, between uh, che Guevara and his uh, Ministry of Industries, and uh, I believe it's INRA, is that correct? The, the INRA, the agricultural uh, sector. And those are, were um, respectively the budgetary finance system, which Guevara spearheaded and had sort of Ernst Mendel as a, a figure who also kind of endorsed this, and the auto financing system. Uh, I, think the, I think Charles Bettelheim played some part in kind of endorsing that system. It's a part of this big thing. And then they get combined <laughs> kind of in a weird way uh, after Che's death. Um, and that's the registry system, um, which uh, is kind of funny reading about because, you know, I think Fidel has a quote where he said, we wanted to take the best of both and end up creating the worst of both or something like this, you know, and a kind of funny way that in, in which he's um, uh, also the, the, you know, they say that the Fidel's greatest character is that he's also the leader of the opposition, you know, and he's always kind of has this great ability to critique, you know. Uh, and so then they move on to a more Soviet style system and then the rectification period, which is sort of like um, a kind of neo guevarist kind of thing in the 80s. Um, and then finally the special period. So if, if I'm, uh, you know, um, Connor, you, you st I think studied rectification a bit um, before. Do you have any, any particular like questions or comments on, on that period? Because I'm, 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 I was very fascinated with that period. I, I wanna know more about it in general. Sure, yeah. Uh, so for, for me, uh, the, the, the period of, of Cuban history that I, I stu studied the most was the 1970s and 1980s um, from, from the lens of sort of Cuban-US relations. And the reason I found, uh, I found that so fascinating is, you know, I, the, there's sort of this like dialectical dance between the United States and, and, and uh, Cuba, wherein like the relations go from like sort of hot and cold, like where it's you have on the one hand, like really obvious, like uh, aggressive stances, right? Like with the like actual like terrorist violence, but then you have like uh, sort of the like sort of soft power subversion, right? Like of like Radio Marti and like all this sort of um, politicking in Washington. So like trying to build like this um, cultural hegemony. Um, I guess for me, like the reason why rectification is is so interesting is that it 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 brings in this other dynamic of um, Cuba's position within the actually existing socialism, like as part of sort of the Soviet bloc. Um, and to me, it seems like on where in the seventies they had sort of embraced pragmatically like this the the um, sort of Soviet style um, command economy. In the 80s, they, they start to see where that can go um, from looking at the Soviet Union. Um, and I just wanted, like, I guess, see, get your, um, your view on, on how looking at the Soviet Union and uh, the sort of reforms of the 1980s um, affected the direction that Cuba went ultimately. Okay, so um, to start off, I think that it's really important to note that while Cuba related to what was going on in the rest of the socialist bloc, not just the Soviet Union, you know, Poland, Yugos Yugoslavia wasn't part of the bloc, but it, you know, um, observing developments in those countries were certainly formational for Che in creating the budgetary finance system, which Christian has just mentioned. So, you know, the fact that um, when Che does his very, very early on 1959, he does his first trip as a representative of the Cuban government, the goodwill mission, as it's called, and he goes to what later become the non-aligned movement countries. And he goes to Yugoslavia. It's the first time he's seen any 
country using a socialist system. It's split from the Soviet bloc. It's developing in its own way. But he immediately, um, because of his capacity to look at sort of anatomically and critically at what's in front of him, how do all the pieces fit together as part of the whole? And, you know, he's, he originally was going to train as a engineer then he shifted to to medicine but that's you know in a sense what one of the things they have in common and that was one of his capacities that sort of analysis and he says well this is an interesting system in Yugoslavia because you have sort of workers control but um, there's also competition and so it seems to be like, like a kind of managerial capitalism so um, it is true that those observations were um, very important for Che but then the great debate, although Bettelheim contributed and although Mandelson contributed, is an internal debate for Cubans. And the focus of it isn't just how are other people building socialism. On the contrary, it's how do we build socialism in the conditions that confront us? And Cuba is a, you know, it's a, um, it's a very different historical development trajectory from the rest of the socialist bloc countries at that time. Uh, in certainly from the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe. It is a colonized nation, 400 years of colonialism, and then under the yoke of US imperialism, right? Completely dominated economy, um, all trade and investment dominated by the United States, politics determined by, you know, the US envoy or ambassador and so on. So it's a different uh, scenario. And the, and the Cubans have always understood that so now you know I, I'm set, making this point because it matters for today people are saying where's Cuba going now is it going towards the Vietnamese model or the China no the Cubans are building a Cuban model they're responding to Cuban conditions which is actually what Marxism would dictate that they do so they were aware of what was going on in the Soviet Union but you know um you mentioned in the question about perestroika and that's not whatever that's that's in the second half of the 1980s. Che Guevara is warning about measures introduced in Poland in 1964 in their Congress saying, you know, I understand these measures. If they are generalized throughout the economy, then basically Poland is on its road back to capitalism, to the restoration of the capital capitalist social relations. So um, I think it's what the point I'm trying to make is that I think rectification comes from an internal impetus and an internal debate, because actually there are signs of Fidel Castro voicing criticism about some of the uh, results of introducing the Soviet economic and planning management system, which they did you know, in the second half of the 1970s, it's not a very long period at all. They're not fully integrated into the um, CIMA, the Council of Mutual Economic Assistance, the so socialist bloc trading uh, group. They're not fully integrated until the second half of the 1970s. And already in 1982, Fidel Castro is making public statements uh, where he is saying, I'm not happy with what's happening, yeah? We are seeing a separation of the, the party from, uh, or the, you know, the leadership of the party from the rank and file. We're seeing um, the purpose of production being distorted. So there's more concern about meeting targets than meeting needs and all these things. So it's very interesting. That's well before perestroika and glasnost announced and in fact it's one of the things that you know you also point out very little has been written about this in english there isn't that much well there is a lot more in cuba in spanish but one of the points that is made is that the cubans started their as they would call it reform process yeah or rectification process it's known as the rectification of errors and negative tendencies before the soviets announced their um uh, Glazhnov and, and, and Perestroika, which was very much opening up uh, liberalization of the market. So they were aware, but I don't think they were sort of following on a lead from the, the socialist bloc. They were clear um, that there was a link between the things that were distorting what they thought socialism should be what should be the purpose of production and this the way that this economic management and planning system uh, organized production and distribution and, and created you know um, 
incentives, privileges, and so on. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the things that you mentioned, uh, which which I thought was really interesting, is that you know the the process of rectification was a, a necessary step or a necessary link for the continuation of Cuban socialism during the special period. That it was it was you know prescient, you know, and 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 like you know you you were just describing you know Fidel and, and both Ch Fidel and Che's prescience, you know, with regards to seeing the flaws in the Soviet system and seeing where that was going. Um, that, that, that really, you know, to me speaks to, you know, why is it that Cuba is still here and communist Poland or Hungary or the Soviet Union and so on aren't, you know, and it's it really your book, I think, makes a very clear point that, that Cuba ha has been able to have a, have a stronger dialogue and kind of genuine connection between the, the, the masses and the people and the, the organized people of Cuba and their governing leadership, you know, um, that I, I just don't get the sense that a lot of other communist bloc countries were able to really forge that strong a mandate. I mean, especially in places where, it, you know, there wasn't really a revolution. I mean, there wasn't really a revolution in a, a lot of the Eastern Bloc. And, and, and there was this sort of you know, kind of occupation that made a lot of people, you know, Poles or, you know, Germans, or whatever, very irritated at, you know, big brother Russia kind of there at the, you know, at the, at the border and kind of understood themselves to be um, whatever, you know, a, a kind of like um, a, a wall between the West and the, and the Soviets. But I don't get the, the impression that Cuba ever, you know, experienced that kind of resentment, you know, t towards the Soviets. And, and it sort of allows them to have a much more kind of flexible understanding of themselves moving forward um yeah so, and yeah it, does that does that kind of make sense i mean is that like <laughs> yeah i mean there's a couple of issues there right i mean the cuban revolution is first of all not a socialist revolution we have to be clear on that it's a cross class um multi-sectoral <laughs> revolutionary movement which rises up in response to a very brutal dictatorship which is very much very openly supported by the united states this is Batista's second period of reign, you know, the second coup, let's say, in Cuba, uh, urged on by the United States, yeah? And during the 1950s, so, I mean, he, the coup takes place in 52, already in 53, you have the first um, armed uprising, which is led by Fidel Castro, Raul, the 26th of July, attack on Mon Carter Barracks. Um, but then, then the dictatorship uh, is very brutal in a way that it wasn't, Batista's reign wasn't in the earlier period. And, you know, estimates are 20,000 Cubans are turned up at the side of the road uh, with signs of torture. I mean, horrific things, right? So um, it was a, uh, a revolutionary movement in the real sense, yeah? And, you know, it's been, it's taken decades to counter for, for academics to do the research to counter the myth that this was, you know, 12 middle class bearded men on an adventure in the mountains. But absolute, that has been um, categorically exposed as false. I mean, it censors the lives and contributions of thousands of Cubans, tens of thousands of Cubans who risked their lives. It was more dangerous um, by the end to be in the cities as a revolutionary than to be in the guerrillas. They used to send them from the cities to join the guerrilla army in the mountains when they needed a break. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, that history has been reclaimed. And um, in essence, at the heart of uh, now one thing I will say, it wasn't a socialist revolution, but it had a socioeconomic platform for change. Right. So if you read uh, History Will Absolve Me, which is, you know, the classic, but it's all there. It's quite clear this becomes this speech, this court defense speech, which is later revised by Fidel Castro and then circulate becomes the mobilizing tool for the movement of the 26th of July, which becomes the main organization in the Cuban revolution. So the message is in the document, right? It says we need um, to remove foreign control of our country. We need national development. We need to give uh, homes to homeless people. We need to provide healthcare, electricity, education to the vast majority of our population. So the big debate is, is that a socialist program, right? 
And, um, it, you know, I've, I've discussed this because I've been teaching a course on Cuban history and, and, you know, we've been discussing with the students. How can you have a document where the um, sections of the middle class, the bourgeoisie, who then subsequently leave Cuba can turn around, having fought on, you know, around this document used as a platform for the movement and say, oh, Fidel Castro betrayed the revolution when he adopted socialism and, and embraced the Soviet Union. And, and on the other hand, the revolutionary state and the revolution says, no, no, this is the logical progression, including this is the logical progression of the struggle of Jose Marti, you know, uh, all the way back in, in, well, actually the wars of independence from 1868, the first war is launched. So um, the, the, the question is, how do you carry out that kind of deep socioeconomic transformation, redistribution of wealth, yeah? Uh, and meet the needs of people in a col colonized country uh, subject to imperialism. You have to confront imperialism. But if you confront imperialism, you confront its domestic allies. So you have a very weak Cuban bourgeoisie whose um, economic status and privilege is based on their relationship to imperialism and to foreign investments and so on. So if you confront imperialism, you're also confronting that class and they're gonna oppose the revolution because there's very few, it's not really a sort of national bourgeoisie in the sense that, that, that existed in other revolutionary movements. So um, the, what, <laughs> what was the point of this? We were talking about why it has sustained. So this, this, so the nature of the Cuban revolution is at its core, it's, it is about the masses. It is about um, uh, social justice and economic equality and access and so on. And it is anti-imperialist at its core. So um, these are the issues, you know, I think that uh, Cuba has done remarkable things within that framework, its development trajectory uh, in terms of what they have done with biotechnology, with sustainable development, with just in general having more doctors per person than anywhere in the world, more educators per person than anywhere in the world. Um, and, and they have achieved that because they adopted socialism. So, you know, as, a, as an underdeveloped country, and I'm saying, using the word underdeveloped, not developing, because they were underdeveloped by colonialism and imperialism. Every time domestic farmers wanted to grow rice or, or other fruit and vegetables, so you know, other vegetables so that the country wasn't dependent on rice imports, a ridiculous situation for, for a country uh, in the Caribbean to be dependent on a food that it can't produce in sufficient quantities. Um, the United States would threaten to pass some legislation and the internal, you know, sugar um, lobby would also uh, take action. So uh, the only way for the Cuban revolutionary state of 1959, the only way they could confront the development challenges that they faced was not by capitalism or imperialism. That, ha that was what had failed the vast majority of the population. It was by the opposite, it was by, by adopting a planned economy, socialized production, socialized distribution, workers control over production and a, a development model which prioritized human welfare. And then subsequently more and more increasingly they've added in the element of um, care for the environment. It kind of reminds me in a way of like more I mean, I, I, it's most of the, the sort of national liberation or anti-imperialist movements of this era, I mean, from the 40s to the, the 70s really had some sort of social socialist element, you know, I mean, even like, you know, Algeria, which is not really regarded as a socialist country ever. I mean, they, they were very interested in, in, in worker self-management with like Ben Bella's administration and so on early on. Um, so I, I, think, I think that's like an interesting, like an interesting part of, of that both the socialist movement and the national liberation movement is, is their in, kind of interconnectivity and the, the kind of necessary um necessary under like uh, aspect of, of solidarity um and, and dignity that is is inherent in socialism but also like uh you know comes to the fore in these like national liberation movements um for sure um let's see 
uh, Connor, do you have any any questions or any comments in particular? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I think that's like a really important point about the Cuban revolution is that it's very much this uh, in response to the conditions of Cuba. I mean, it is something like fascinating that like you, you get Fidel at the start of his like really political career, um, basically trying to realize the, the constitution of 1940, right? But then he realized it's almost like a case study in the limits of of lim uh, limits of liberalism in a colonized country, right? Like you can't realize the the, the dreams of, of, of sort of um, liberal uh, values in a colonized country. Um, and so it it in itself brings about the need for socialism, right? Like, and I think that's just a really like important point and something that people need to like understand for the trajectory of the 20th century, why all of these uh, national liberation movements tended to have ones that ended up taking on a socialist character ended up happening in developing or underdeveloped countries. It reminds me a bit, I mean, um, when Hugo Chavez was elected in 98 and 99, he was hardly a socialist, you know, and, and there's these, um, you know, comments of his that we need a little bit of the state and a little bit of the free market, you know, and this sort of thing. Uh, the third way, I think he talked about, because this was the era of, um, in Britain, of Tony Blair, who yeah. was talking about the third way. Well, it's really funny, like, one, one of the parts of like just this history that like always tickles me is, you know, the reflection uh, in the West of this like really recent history, you know, which is just so damnable. I mean, you're talking about these terrorist campaigns, you know, that the U.S. is basically funding these gangsters in Cuba to, to fucking bomb and, you know, just raise absolute hell. And then like, you know, a couple years later, unironically, uh, <laughs> launch this massive war on terror, you know, it's, it's like, it's just like a joke, you know, that the, 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 the way, um, the, just the total hypocrisy that especially the United States is like maintains constantly. It's, it's very frustrating, you know, to, to be in the United States and just to sort of see it all the time. Um, <laughs> immensely frustrating, but yeah, it's a part of it. Yeah, I oh. mean, at the, at the time when um, Bush was saying, you know, if you, anyone who harbors a terrorist is a terrorist, meanwhile, uh, you had Luis Pasada Carriles, you had Orlando Bosch, uh, and a whole load of other ones, um, including some who are still alive and roaming around freely in Miami. Um, you know, people who have boasted on camera to journalists of being behind bomb plots. Pasada Carriles and Orlando Bosch are probably most well known for being the masterminds behind a bombing of a civilian airlines in 19. 76 was it uh which was the the, the flight from um, Barbados which was blown up they paid someone to put a bomb on it and uh, everyone died including the the uh, crew and on board were Cuba's um a, a team of Cuban fencers who were returning victorious from the Pan-American Games and they were among the victims you know and and this guy has boasted to a journalist that he was behind it and the Cubans have the evidence and, and there he is and he, he, he lived and died in his final years in full liberty in Miami. Never well, paid for his crimes. It, it, when people, anytime people mention human rights abuses to me in Cuba, I always say yes and that's why we need to close down Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> you know, uh, well, so, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so why did they pick Guantanamo Bay to keep mm -hmm. their so-called um, enemy combatants? Because mm -hmm. Guantanamo Bay has a, a, is a sort of legal loophole. It doesn't count as U.S. territory. The Cubans don't accept that it exists there. So it's sort of uh, outside jurisdictions and they could get away with violating, uh, you know, in their treatment of the prisoners, their horrific things that were happening, absolutely horrific. You remember those images of the way these people were made to shuffle around in their orange jumpsuits with um, black hoods and then the waterboarding and all the rest of it, you know, and, and what did the world do? They criticized Cuba because, I don't know, in 2003, it arrested 75 
um, so-called journalists who, um, you know, who were exposed to have links to USAID uh, and various, you know, the State Department and various other channels of getting money in. And the Cubans knew that because when they did the court case, they pulled out eight Cubans who had been working, you know, Cuban intelligence, been working within those groups with those people for many years, collecting the evidence. But of course, it's ignored, it's ignored by the mainstream media, because as you say, the concept of a war on terrorism was never part of it. You know, you can't um, combat terrorism by terrorizing populations. That's the first thing. And I'll never forget, I'm sure most people will never forget when Chavez went on television and he said, you know, yes, we're against terrorism. And then he held up a picture of a, a you know, a murdered Iraqi child. And he said, but not like this, not like this. Yeah, Hugo Chavez always had an incredible way of um, of really sticking it to him. And I was reminded of his, of his UN speech where he talks about you know, smelling like sulfur and, you know, <laughs> with regards to George Bush, you know, he says the devil was here. Uh, just, you know, really brilliant <laughs> on, on that front. Um, so kind of in conjunction to with what I was saying before about what, what makes the Cuban experience so unique as a socialist experience and why it's been able to have such tenacity. Um, I want to talk a little bit about democracy in Cuba because a lot of people, even socialists, you know, will will plenty of them will say, "Oh, we're for socialists, but not like Cuba." You know, we want the, the, the democratic sort. But um, you know, I've read over their constitution. I've tried to read over both the seventy six and uh, two thousand eighteen, I believe, and it, it is a it is a democratic country. I mean, it's not a liberal bourgeois democracy, but it is a democracy. And I think we we really have to fight. Um, on the grounds that Cuba is a democracy, and it might not be, you know, perfect or exactly as we want it, but, but you know, for Christ's sake, they're right off the right off the coast of um, Florida. So, you know, there has to be some mechanisms for preserving uh, a system which is under severe attack. So, um, you know, I, I was kind of curious about you. I remember reading this article, and in, in it was written in uh, eighteen or uh, nineteen seventy four by Raúl Castro. And the kind of gist of the article is he says, you know, the Cuban people have trusted the revolutionaries, you know, and they've put a lot of faith in us. And it's time for us to return that faith in the form of, you know, popular assemblies or in the form of, of kind of like uh, people's power, organ, organs for people's power, I think is the exact um, phrase, you know. So he basically says like, it's time to basically integrate the governance of uh, a kind of socialist Cuba with the, you know, the people, a self-governance of sort, and then the 76 constitution comes about. And you, you mentioned in, in um, you know, during rectification, there's the idea of the, um, the, the uh, people's councils that gets implemented in, I think, uh, 91. There's these workers' parliaments and so on. So I, I'm, and of course, uh, not to mention, um, you know, uh, the CDR and so on. So I'm really curious, you know, how is, like, how does, you know, d democracy function in Cuba, and you know, in what ways is it, uh, you know, does it does it differ from kind of liberal bourgeois democracy or whatever? And um, you know, I, I'm just kind of curious to, to, for you to, to kind of flesh that out because that, that's something I'm I'm really fascinated by myself. Yeah. Okay. Well, you could write a PhD thesis, <laughs> thesis on this, but I'll try and summarize it. I mean, let me just say, right, the the fact is, as just to clarify what you're saying, right, the revolution seizes power. They take the state on the 1st of January, 1959. And they're asked, you know, when are you going to, you know, re-establish, re because um, Batista had held elections, no one believed him, he was the only candidate. And the first after the coup, he'd got rid of the constitution. So when are you going to re-establish democracy? And they said, we, we'll do it, you know, soon, right? And soon turned out to be quite a long time. It was, as you say, 1976, new constitution, new system, uh, national system of people's power. But let me just remind, you know, listeners that the Cubans had experience of liberal uh, democracy, right? They had experience of that and it hadn't worked very well for them. They had experience from 1902, Right when the Republic of Cuba, which is often referred to as the pseudo-republic and neo-colony, you know, under the Platt Amendment, 
and uh, basically the US would decide which side it wanted to win, very much like what goes on in Latin America today, actually. And um, if, you know, the other side complained and then there was a, you know, the Liberal Party had an armed uprising within a few years and then the Platt Amendment, under the Platt Amendment, the US sends its military forces back in and this, this goes on and on. Then you have the uh, revolution of 1933 and 100 days government, which, uh, uh, you know, abrogates the Platt Amendment and various other measures, but then that's removed by a coup carried out, you know, organized by the US, carried out by Batista. And then you have, you know, nominally, again, a, a party system, right, where you have different presidents represent uh, candidates from different parties. Uh, the US is behind the scenes, pulling the strings, either through Batista or, or separately. But you have a period from 1944 uh so batista has stood as president he's been elected 1940 um support from the communist party at that point uh, quite a progressive program of some development of schools and and so on although military schools so th th that was the norm in that period that sort of populist period populist nationalism in latin america in 1940 uh, but he cannot stand as a candidate again in 44 his candidate loses and he accepts it so you go back to this you know bourgeois democratic system but it is possibly the most corrupt system period in cuban history right political history it's corrupt there's incredible violence the communist leaders of trade unions are assassinated uh it's targeted assassinations so you know what come 1959 cubans aren't excited about the prospects of going back to a party system what a surprise yeah um because these things are judged on on experience yeah so um they have a revolutionary state they have various mechanisms if you look at the organizations of the masses the women's federation the um street committees the union of young communists they're all set up straight away within months yeah of the revolution so there are different uh forums for people to participate for people to advocate for people to debate for people to represent that's the first thing then you get the formal you and you have gradual an increase in sort of levels of representation till you get the national assembly of people's power now let's just deal with the question of um, democracy there are 550 or more words that can be uh, um, added to the word democracy, participative democracy, representative democracy, bourgeois democracy, liberal democracy, you can go on and on, right? But what has happened is that this specific form of representation of um, the advanced capitalist countries has monopolized the term democracy, right? We can call it parliamentary liberalism. It is the political form that corresponds with the, the economic form of liberalism, in other words, capitalism. So there is a form of political organization representation which serves the interests of the economic infrastructure, which is capitalism, right? So, um, you know, when we say, when we ask this question about is Cuba democratic? what most people are doing is saying does Cuba a socialist country have the system of representation that has emerged and dominated in capitalist countries well what a surprise it doesn't and you wouldn't expect it to right and we can get engaged in art in arguments and Raul Castro has addressed this very clearly if we are permitted different political parties in Cuba what would be the kind of parties that were set up? Well, they'd be funded through the 20 million that is already spent, uh, approved by the United States Congress, paid by you lot, the taxpayer in the United States, and is channeled into Cuba in what they call democracy promotion programs and what the Cubans call regime change programs, right? Which are quite clearly regime change programs because they are designed to change the political and economic system in Cuba. And um, so if Cuba allowed another party, there is no doubt that there would be massive funding from outside uh, to set up a, um, a party which was had the objective of uh, fostering, fomenting a transition uh, away from socialism. Right. That's that's clear. 
Then there are all the other arguments about actually the Cuban revolution has very much placed itself as the legacy of Jose Marti, who set up the Cuban Revolutionary Party, who said all Cubans must unite in this one revolutionary party and we can have differences and we can have debates and we can represent different colors class genders and all the rest of it but we do it within one united revolutionary party and there's those that say well this is the cuban model but the fact is that they have a different system of political participation and representation now if you um conclude that to be categorized as democratic, you need the party, the two party system, which can put someone like Donald Trump in the presidency. You'll look to Cuba and you will logically conclude that Cuba is not democratic. But if you question what democracy means and you see that it means power for the people, then you can open your mind and actually have a look at the institutions the Cubans have and the way they function, right? So that's the first question. Are we open-minded when we look? And when we look, what we find is that the Cubans have taken certain principles for their political system, which are vitally important. For a start, and this is a shocker to a lot of people, and they get very cynical, they don't quite believe you. The Communist Party doesn't stand in elections. These are not party political elections. So that's the first thing. You have a communist party. There is no doubt that the communist party uh, has the function of being, as, as Che called it, the motor for society. It's supposed to lead development, political development and so on, but it's not supposed to be carrying out admin. And that's a constant critique that they're making is the communist party too involved with the administrative functions and blah, blah, blah. Right, so first of all, the Communist Party doesn't stand in elections. Who stands in elections, you say? Ah, people stand in elections, yeah? So how does it work? So, um, I don't know, let's start, let's start at the bottom. So at the bottom, you have something called municipalities. There are, oh my gosh, I'm going from memory, 167, 168 municipalities in Cuba. It changes at times, you know, the other point to make is the Cuban political system has been constantly in flux. There's a constant internal criticism, critique and debate and constantly measures are taken to increase decentralization, to um, make the representation more direct or more genuine and so on. That's a, that's a constant process. So. In every municipality, you have, you, you know, you, you start off with street committees, right? So you have a, a, a street committee, CDR, Committees for the Defense of the Revolution. On every street, they have elected president, treasurer, general secretary that rotates on a, a very frequent basis. Anyone who wants to get involved can get involved. It's not exclusive. You're not paid. So there's no incentive to do it for monetary gain or for status and so on. So uh, you have those things. Then you have popular councils, which are smaller areas, um, like what we call in Britain wards. But then you have the municipal assemblies. So the municipal assemblies are, we call them in, in, in Britain, that's the equivalent to a borough. Um, and people, the, the elections for the municipal assemblies are every two years. Now, who stands in the municipal assembly? Well, first of all, you can't nominate yourself. Now, this is a rule at every stage of the Cuban elections. You have to be nominated by someone else, right? So um, you get nominated and, you know, you have to get a certain amount of, of uh, agreement and then you get nominated. And then when you stand in your election, you, you have an election campaign, right? And this is your election campaign. It's one A4 piece of paper. That's blank, but you have to imagine. You put your picture there. And you say all of the organizations or entities you're a member of, the work that you do, and then you're telling the community what you've done for them. You say, I have helped in a campaign to get women over 50 to go for a mammogram. I fought in Angola against the apartheid regime. I, you know, whatever it is, I've organized a local football team. So this is the basis on which you're getting elected. Yeah, it's how much you've done for your community. And no one can have, millions funding TV adverts or any of the rest of it, right? So um, then there has to be at least two candidates for elections to take place. There has to be less than eight. 
um, the elections take place, children guard ballot boxes, <laughs> and um, you have to, you know, get over half or else they have to run it again and so on. Oh, you, you know, you have to have a certain amount of turnout and so on. And then when you have won the election, right, here's another shocker. You're not paid and you're not a professional politician. Not only that, so you carry on doing the work that you do with the salary that you do. So you don't lose your roots in the community, in the workplace. You don't suddenly become part of the elite. You're, if you're, you know, you're a worker, you continue to be a worker. Yeah. Um, but also every, at least every six months, you have to go back to your constituents and you have to do what's called rendering accounts. You have to tell them how you have represented them. And if they've come to you with problems, you have to tell them the results that you got. Now, this is not just an exercise. Your electorate have the right to recall you. So you, they have the right to recall, yeah? So, and then um, until the new constitution, there was a, an intermediate level where the whole process happens again for the provincial assemblies, but the provincial assemblies, uh, elections come from those who are already elected in the municipal assemblies, and it goes up to the provincial assemblies. That layer has been eliminated in the new constitution. Now you just have provincial councils, and the next election is up into the national assembly. So in the national assembly, you've got 620 something members. Again, that, that's slightly in flux usually, but uh, you know, it's a, it's a big body and um, half of the National Assembly is taken up by people who are elected in the way that I've said, they coming up from the neighborhoods. Now, I remember um, meeting a, uh, a, an elderly black woman from Guantanamo, the most rural area you can imagine in Cuba in a mountain. And she was the region's representative in Havana at the National Assembly. And we were talking about, you know, how much do you feel, you, you live out here in isolation, how much do you feel that the government has your ear? She's like, I'm in the National Assembly. You know, I am the government, <laughs> actually. It was just, just an incredible insight. So um, in the National Assembly, half of the people seated there come through that way. But the other half come through their own process of elections, of nominating, someone else nominates you, you're elected and so on, through the either work, work sectors or organizations of the masses. And that's how you have a situation where there are representatives of the Students Federation, University Students Federation are sitting in parliament. And you have tobacco workers, sitting in parliament, um, obviously trade unionists and so on. And you can have people as well representing cultural and artistic backgrounds. You might have, they also have some sort of people who are, you know, uh, distinguished personalities who are also invited. Now, let me tell you something else that people find really shocking. The Castros, Raul and Fidel, are also elected through this process. Now, I remember a Cuban friend of mine explaining this in a, to an audience in the UK, and they said, are you joking? Are you telling me I could stand against Fidel Castro? And my Cuban friend said, you could stand against Fidel Castro, but I wouldn't vote for you because we have a, a meritocracy, yeah? So, you know, when we assess what have you done for the Cuban people versus what has he done, he's probably going to win against everyone, hands down. So, you know, that I just, it's just really interesting that um, to, to point out to people, yeah, the um, Fidel Castro is, is elected up from the base. So was Raul and um, all of the leadership are elected there. Now in this, in my country, I'm pretty sure it's the same. I don't claim to be an expert on the US political system. In your case, the president and mine, the prime minister can select their ministers and you know and their representatives and their special advisors their special advisors cannot even be known to the public um in cuba once you get into the national assembly with the 620 something people then the national assembly itself elects a council of state so that's another election that raul fidel and so on has to get into the council of state uh, elects a um uh, a, a polit no, sorry, that's the party. The Council of State elects 
a smaller group to, to um, run the country. And basically then Fidel Castro gets elected, was, I'm, set, I'm talking in present tense, it should be past tense, as the president of the Council of State, right? So this is the other interesting thing. He was always referred to as president of Cuba, but technically he was the president of the Council of State. Um, and the Council of State operated on a consensus basis. So Fidel couldn't say, well, actually, I'm moving this person from minister of this, that and the other. He had to have the argument, win the argument. Now, you may say, and, you, and, and it may be right, no one would stand up to Fidel. No one would say no to Fidel. There is evidence to the contrary. There is a lot of evidence, like you pointed out earlier on, that they ended up in the 1970s with many reservations adopting the socialist system. It's pretty acknowledged that um, this was something that Fidel Castro had not been in favor of, but he'd lost the argument partly because, and this is something we didn't mention, and it, uh, you know, it's, we can get di uh, digress too far down historical tracks, but in 1970, they had this huge campaign, which they'd worked up to for the 10 million ton harvest and it had failed. And that was very much a, a project that Fidel Castro was pushing and pushing. And as it had failed, he'd kind of lost the argument at that point. So, um, you know, then the, the, the economy is a result partly, it's not just the registry system, it's also because getting people out from the cities into the countryside to do the sugar harvest people with no experience of how to uh, you know cut sugar cane did more damage than good and so on um workplaces were were stopped productivity plummeted so it wasn't just the registry system it was all of these things happening at the same time and that that was the set of circumstances that led them to feel that it was necessary to adopt the soviet system but there are clearly times, this is the point I'm making, where you can see there is there are debates among the leadership. But what happens is, this, so they have these quite fervent debates in the National Assembly, but they work on the basis of consensus. So once a, a vote is, a decision is made, a vote is taken and it's almost always unanimous. That doesn't mean there hasn't been arguments, debates, points, counterpoints, and so on. It means that they are um, still very much with this notion that, you know, of the United Revolutionary Party. We have to unite behind the majority decision. Thank you so much for that rundown, because um, I, I think that is, to me, one of the most essential, for, for me personally, one of the most essential things that I've come to understand about Cuba, and I just don't think a lot of people get, is that it is a democracy. It doesn't look yeah. like the United States, but it is a democracy. So the, and, um, yeah, just the things that I've described are like the formal institutions of democracy, right? I've hardly talked about the organizations of masses, mm. but there they are. They operate with their sectors and they operate in the National Assembly. But the other element of um, Cuban democracy, which is quite extraordinary, <laughs> and about which very little is said outside Cuba, is the element of the national consultations and debates over policy. So, um, you know, and this, this is something that sort of come, developed through from the early days of the revolution, right? You've all seen that footage of Fidel Castro. He's standing in front of a huge audience, you know, million Cubans or something, um, 1961 just before the Bay of Pigs invasion they know it's coming you know the the first bits of aggression have happened and he says do you agree with the free health care and they oh, yeah see do you agree with you know what we've done with this that and the other yes well the, this is socialism right and it's this um they're having the sort of dialogue with the people are you coming with us yeah are we moving together the leadership with the people and then the, this gets much more formalized by this uh, procedure of having debates with the population so um in i mean there's lots of examples in my book i've got a whole chapter about the um, what i call raul's reforms the period from 2008 really when raul starts to introduce a set of mainly economic measures <laughs> Um, but all the time based on feedback and, and guidance from the population. So this starts after Raul um, makes a speech in actually in 
2007 on the anniversary of Fidel Castro's last speech before he becomes ill. No one's seen Fidel for a year. Raul has stepped into his shoes, but he hasn't done a big public speech. And the 26th of July, 2007, he comes out and does this speech where he makes a, um, a cutting criticism of various problems in Cuba, low productivity, um, hardly any food is being produced domestically. The land has been taken over by something called marabou, which is a, um, a, a weed with deep roots, which is fawny. It comes from the Middle East, apparently. Uh, and, you know, he's saying we, we know that the salaries aren't high enough to, to afford the food, but we can't do anything until productivity increases. We know that uh, you know, all, all these problems and, and Cuba and it really, you know, Raul has always had this capacity. There are examples in the past where he's articulated the biggest concerns and complaints of the population. And so in response, everyone's talking about this speech. Right. And, you know, um, the Communist Party, that's what it is. It's listening. It's hearing all the time. It's it's there. It's everywhere. Its members are everywhere. And so they say, you know, pe that really resonated. Right. So immediately they start to organize these forums where people can say these are the problems that I think our country has. But these are also the solutions that, that we recommend, you know, highly educated population. Right. You go, if you're going to listen to everyone, you're going to come out with some great ingenious solutions. So then they formalize this in um, some of the, the feedback gets put into something called the draft guidelines for changing the economic and social a system and they get these draft guidelines in 2000 late 2010 get circulated for everyone in the country to get a copy to read and to go to a meeting whether it's in their neighborhood at work in their cultural center school university wherever it is and um maybe not school but probably not that young but university certainly and um to go in and and give feedback. What do we like about this document? What don't we? And on the basis of that feedback, every single comment was um, anonymously recorded and then categorized. So, you know, they had these incredible statistics. We received 730,000, you know, comments, which we can categorize into this many different recommendations. And as a result of that national consultation, 68% of the guidelines were changed. I mean, that is phenomenal. Uh, when uh, we, have, when we have a public consultation here, it's a paper exercise, it's a PR exercise. It doesn't change policy. They know what they wanna do, they have their agenda, but that is real democracy. I remember I've, I've told some people about that, the consultations especially, and it's, it's, it's like really remarkable. And, and you know, you ask people, you know, were, what, were you consulted uh, when, you know, uh, after 2008 uh, as to what ought to be done with bailing out these uh, massive, uh, you know, corporations? Were, were you consulted? No. You know, it's extremely unpopular. Almost everybody hated the way that was unfolded. You know what I mean? Uh, and, you know, people might, might say, well, you know, Cuba doesn't elect their president. But I don't get the fe feeling that very many Americans would say that they elect their president. Um, and if they do, they're a, a sucker. <laughs> you know, they're a real sucker. If you actually think that, you know, that your vote counts, you know, in, in so far as it has to be, uh, you know, filtered through the electoral college and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, I'll just mention for our listeners, there's two videos which I thought were, or there's a video by a YouTuber named Azure Scapegoat that talks about uh, the Cuban Constitution that kind of runs down a, a, a lot of what uh, Helen just mentioned, which I think was. Is great and um, and he he does a great job with that. And then also there's a Telesaur article that came out in 2018 or 2019, going uh, basically comparing U.S. elections to the Cuban Constitution. And I think both of those are really helpful in kind of elucidating uh, Cuban democracy. Um, for sure. Can I just can I just end with a with yeah. a anecdote on that? Mm -hmm. So apparently, when Obama went to Cuba and met Raúl Castro, which was what two thousand and fifteen, I think, yeah, two, March two thousand and fifteen, um, and Raúl uh, Obama was saying something like, "Why don't you have an, you know two parties, and uh, why don't you have more than one party?" And Raúl says to him, "Well, why don't you have more than one party?" He says, "We do. We have the Democrats and the Republicans." And he says, "Yeah, that's like me and Fidel Castro setting up two, <laughs> two different parties. It's the same thing." So, I, I can't remember who said it, but I, I, there was one. Uh, I, I, 
I hate that I can't remember, but uh, an African national liberation leader said, you know, the United States is a one party dictatorship, but in typical American extravagance, they have two of them, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, true. I mean, it's true, you know, it's, it really is true. And I, I you know, it, it, I mean, that's a sentiment which I've seen really across the board. I mean, a lot of right wingers in this country who are, you know, not really necessarily very studied in politics and just kind of go after this kind of vaguely libertarian patriot kind of gut reaction. I mean, so many people are just just absolutely detest the fact that we only have two parties, and it's nearly impossible to get a third one up and running. Um, but you know, even if they did, okay, even if they did, how do you, you know, there was so much excitement in Britain about uh, you know the idea of a uh, Jeremy Corbyn leading the Labour Party, but you know, it's not the political parties aren't the system. Yeah, the po political parties are just sort of. The expressions of this system or the puppets who who are put up to represent the system you know you can't change the the imperialist capitalist nature of britain or the us by um by putting a, a you know a left-wing person at the head of a party they would have to completely change all of the structures of the country the economic relationships the power of the monopolies the power of finance capital the uh, wealth that is extracted from the, the developing or underdeveloped world and how that sustains the standard of living we enjoy in our countries. A hundred percent. And that, and that's why, you know, everybody, at, everybody at Cosmonaut is, you know, deeply committed to the, the, the idea that, you know, if we're going to, if our program and our, our, our pl platform and, and plan, you know, e even if it's, you know, it looks so far away right now has to be one against the constitution and has to be against the way things are totally, you know, um, and that they're really, you, you can't have a, a, a Bernie with no reservations, you know, or no um, illusions, you know, that we have to really scrap the illusions and understand that if, you know, if you're going to change things, you actually have to change things, you know, it, it can't be, you know, within the constitutional order, it's just simply not going to happen. Not in this country. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you can do Britain. things. You, you, you can. You know, there is an argument, right? The minimum and maximum uh, demands and the rest of it. And you know, people um, really see, learn the contradictions of the system through struggle. So it's not like we sit back and go, oh, "Well, you know, you're not going <laughs> to, you can't have a revolution in the United States." So don't do anything. You know, people um, have to, they learn and grow and develop through struggle. And that's exactly what happened in Cuba. If you think that the Cuban revolution comes out of the 1950s, the McCarthyist period, and Cuba was, you know, dominated culturally and politically and ideologically by the United States. And loads of the people I interviewed for my book on Che, who were, you know, the, the uh, worked with Che and so on, they said before, even during the revolution, I participated in the movement of the 26th of July and I thought I was an anti-communist. And then after the, you know, it was declared this was a socialist revolution, I said, well, Fidel's a communist and Che's a communist, I'm a communist. But it reminds me of that great Zinoviev quote where he's speaking to the, uh, the I think in Hala, he's speaking to the SPD and the, or I can't remember exactly how, 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 what the, but I got it from the Ben Lewis and, and Lars Lee book when, you know, Zinoviev says that the, the, the old um, Russian babushka who's never read the communist platform, never will, and doesn't really give a shit about communism and all that, and will never don the black leather vest, that she's more of a communist than all of the, you know, the, 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 the most intense, you know, commissal, uh, you know, youngin who's going out into the, the peasantry, you know, that it's, it really is like if, if everyday people can sort of understand um, and are kind of allowed the, the, the space of what solidarity means, the social aspect of socialism, then, you know, if we can bring that to the people, then our job, you know, it, it, that's really where it starts, you know, in a way. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and to, to your point, Christian, I, I, uh, I actually have an interesting anecdote. I worked with a, a, a right wing Cuban who just recently uh, emigrated within the last four years or so. Um, and the, one of the things that he had to begrudgingly admit is just how popular Fidel was. He would tell me stories. He said, like, he was an anti-communist, uh, but he said, like, I, I knew communists who say I, or anti-communists would say, I hate communism, but I love Fidel. And that's even to this day. Like, so <laughs> it, it's, it's one of those things like where, 
the experience of the revolution and, and, and what happens is so important, even if like from an ideological perspective, they may, may disagree. Um, and one thing I think like just to sort of steer the conversation uh, more towards like uh, the current situation in dealing with COVID because you've, you've um, uh, done some great work at highlighting what Cuba is doing. Um, so you mentioned earlier the, the 1970 uh, Zafra. Um, so I remember going through some State Department memos where they're looking on uh, at what's going on and they're, they're, they're commenting that they're happy either way. So basically the, the note on the memo was even if they succeed, they've diverted so many resources to the Zafra that they're going to have to uh, sort of go towards pragmatically to the Soviet model. And what they thought that was going to mean was less uh, intervention in the region so that they were going to be less involved in, in Latin America, um, which tended, ended up not being the case, but that's what they, they ex expected to happen. And so I think like talking a little bit about like the internationalism of the Cuban revolution that has always been at the heart of it, I think is, is something um, it, important to talk to about COVID, um, but even, you know, broader than that. Yeah, so uh, it's really interesting because the, as we've discussed in the 70s is when the Cubans moved towards the um, Soviet model of planning and management. Um, and for a long time, many scholars and I'm uh, particularly talking about Cubanologists who are part of a, you know, have an ideological position and part of a sort of political uh, position, paradigm, let's say, and describe this period as the Sovietization um, period. And um, the, the interesting thing is it's true that in the economic sense, they moved towards the Soviet model, but what they were doing in Africa was demonstrating that the Cubans had an independent foreign policy throughout. Um, so they, I mean, just, just to rewind, right at the outset, the Cubans showed that they identified as um, their revolution, not just it was a question of, you know, socialist revolution or communist revolution, but as a anti-imperialist revolution, a revolution of the in the in the sense of post-colonial anti you know independence, national liberation, and so on, and they immediately um, related to other movements on that basis, on the basis of anti-imperialism and uh, global south, as we now call them, but they weren't called that at the time. Um, and this is re like really evident very quickly. So in 1962, they, you know, still trying to set up the new institutions of state, the new social relations, new social values and so on. They send a group of soldiers to Algeria to assist those who are fighting for national liberation in Algeria um, before they are victorious. So then they have their victory and, oh, and incidentally, so they send soldiers and when they return, they return with injured Algerian soldiers and some orphans and they give them medical treatment in Cuba. So this is the first time they're treating people in Cuba. Um, they have already sent doctors overseas. So 1960, there's a terrible earthquake in Chile, the, the biggest ever at that point. And they don't even have relations with the Chilean government. No political alignment there. They have very few doctors, totally insufficient. Um, they had you know, just over 6,000, uh, 1959, half of them are leaving. Um, and yet they send, they managed to send some medics to um, Chile to give assistance after this terrible earthquake in a short term. So that was one of the forms of if medical internationalism, which is developed, which we're seeing today in the COVID-19 pandemic. It's that emergency response medical brigades that starts 1960, the year after the revolution. 1962, you have the soldiers going, they're already supporting um, guerrilla fighters who are inspired by the Cuban revolution, inspired by the so-called Foco theory by Che Guevara that, you know, guerrillas can spark a movement when the objective conditions already exist for revolutionary change. We need to create the subjective conditions. They're supporting those movements. And then, um, 
throughout the 1960s, they're engaged in, uh, in several countries in Africa in either um, anti-colonial or post-colonial struggles. And this culminates in their intervention in Angola which is something quite remarkable. And the scholar, I would encourage anyone who's interested in this to read the work of Piero Iglesias, who is the scholar who did archive research in you know, the US archives, Moscow's archives, uh, all over Britain, all over Europe and so on, and had some access to Cuban archives. And he shows irrefutably that this was an independent Cuban foreign policy. Basically, um, the MPLA had just got in, uh, led the movement for independence in Angola from Portugal, and Neto, the leader of the MPLA, was the president. And they, as soon as they became independent, they came under attack by forces inside the country that were supported by the United States and South Africa to destabilize this new left wing uh, revolutionary government. And subsequently, they were invaded by the apartheid um, South African army, which was occupying Namibia, been occupied in Namibia since 1915 in violation of international treaties. And they entered Cuba. So Neto asked for assistance. The Cubans responded in something like six months, something like 36,000 Cubans who had all volunteered, went to um, support the Angolans to, def to uh, defend this new state. They return home, but they, but also it should, I should say that they've taken you know medical personnel with them. That was a feature of the Cubans when they went to um, some countries in Africa in the 1960s. They carried out a mass vaccination campaign with medics, you know, while they were supporting the the um, armed struggles. So um, South Africa, you know, attacks uh, attacks Angola again in the 1980s, and the Cubans respond by sending um, more troops, a mass of, of troops. And, you know, the Soviets weren't behind that. The Soviets had to accept a fait accompli, begrudgingly, apparently, subsequently supply uh, resources and supplies and so on. Um, so the Cubans have always shown this independence. And the key point here is that internationalism has always been at the heart of the Cuban revolution. In fact, Jose Marti wrote a fascinating letter the day before he went into battle fighting for Cuban independence and was killed. Uh, his, his letter is to a Mexican friend and he makes it really clear in this letter, a couple of things. He sees that Cuba is in some ways a bulwark against the US new, you know, aspiring imperialism, the aspiration to dominate the Americas and that um, you know, the region has to stand together against this imperialist power. That's why he talks about Nuestra America, our America against their America. So this idea that Cuban nationalism is integral, is, is somehow com combined with internationalism that is anti-imperialist is really at the heart of this ideology and political trend that the Cuban revolution comes to represent. So the Cubans are against imperialism and they see imperialism as producing the um, structural conditions that create global poverty, poor health, you know, and at the same time, from the Cuban perspective, as a socialist development, uh, social, socialist country, they see um, healthcare as a human right, housing as a human right, education as a human right. So the, for them, the struggle to take healthcare to other countries is part of their struggle against the global conditions that result from a well divided by imperialist countries and, and oppressed nations. So, you know, it, it's a, for the Cubans, the, the drive to send troops to support anti-imperialist struggles, national liberation struggles, post-colonial struggles, is the same drive as, as that to send um, medics to every country, every corner of the world. But before the pandemic, Cuba had sent 400,000 400, medical professionals to provide healthcare that was free at the point of delivery in 164 countries, by far the vast majority of countries, not in the highly developed European countries 
or the United States, but that changed with the pandemic. So when COVID-19 started, if you think back almost exactly a year, in late March, Italy, Lombardy, in the region, uh, region within Italy, was the epicenter of the global pandemic. And others ran. Italy was saying, the Italians were saying, I remember on the news, where is our, why is no one helping us? And the Cubans ran to them. And they went there with a brigade of over 50 medical specialists. And these weren't, they're not just medics. They're also specialists in, in epidemiological uh, issues. So disease control, disaster response, organizing these Henry Reed brigades. A lot of that first group had been to West Africa, if you remember, in, nine, in 2014, terrible, deadly outbreak of Ebola. And the Cubans were there with the biggest contingent for the longest amount of time, you know, and even the um, director of the World Health Organization said, we, you know, we asked, we asked for help and countries threw money at us. But what we needed was compassionate doctors able to save lives despite being covered in PPE and the Cubans answered the call. And in fact, I spoke to the guy in Cuba who was um, put in charge of organizing and training the Cubans who went on that brigade to combat Ebola. He'd been studying Ebola since the 1980s. He'd never seen a case of Ebola because of course it doesn't exist in Cuba, but he knew about the disease and he was the director of the Hospital of Tropical Diseases in Cuba, which has played a really big role in Cuban medical internationalism. And he says that when the call went out, so someone would go to all the hospitals and doctors um, places and say you know we're putting out a call who would volunteer to go to um, West Africa to try and help people there with Ebola then over 10,000 Cuban medical professionals volunteered in the end they didn't send 10,000 they they sent 250 who had been trained and selected from a group of 400 that were, were trained in Havana so yeah, an incredible history. The Henry Reeve Brigade, let me just um, mention how it got its name. So actually the Cubans have done this, a form of um, medical internationalism, responding to emergencies. They've done it all over the world, all over the decades, but it got the name Henry Reeve um, in 2005, which was in direct response to Hurricane Katrina. So we're back on your turf now. Um, Hurricane Katrina, I'm sure you, you remember it well, uh, terrible, terrible images of people stranded, you know, uh, on their roofs and the waters rising and so on, and New Orleans had been flooded, and the Cuban medics started to gather at the airport in Havana, and they were ready with their backpacks full of equipment, diagnostics and stuff. Now, the Cubans were the best trained in the world for those circumstances. They are trained to operate without electricity, without diagnostic equipment. During their training, they actually say, how would you diagnose this patient in the Amazon? Right. They are the best people to operate in those emergency circumstances. And they started to gather in the airport and, you know, through official channels, the Cubans contacted the U.S., establishment of the US government and made the offer of sending medics and they didn't even reply. It's not that they said, no, thank you. They didn't even acknowledge the offer, but they gave the, the name Henry Reeve to this group of people in the airport because this was the name of a US born citizen who had gone to Cuba to help Cuba in its fight against the Spanish in the Cuban war of independence, Henry Reeve. So, you know, no reply from them. Fidel Castro says it was terrible. It was as if a boat was just off the coast, coast of Cuba and it was slowly sinking and we wanted to go and save lives. And, you know, we, we just couldn't. They clearly couldn't send medics onto U.S. Didn't, territory. Didn't very shortly thereafter, the, the, the thanks that the United States did offer was to list, uh, I think David Frum is responsible for this, but listing Cuba as one of the, was it the axis of evil or something? Was that, was that, was that near... It's the same time was it just, just that had happened before that was oh, okay. um our, our our friend she said with complete cynicism don't <laughs> uh john bolton oh john yes bolton. dear friend <laughs> yeah. he who loves um he who loves his sloganeering titles yeah so um at that point it was axis of evil evil rogue states and all the rest of it that was in um 2002 so in between the invasion bombing and invasion of afghanistan 
in 2001 and then bombing an invasion of Iraq in 2003. They put Cuba in the crosshairs. Um, they accused Cuba of developing biological weapons in its, uh, the world was starting to really notice Cuba had this incredible biotech sector. And um, it was such an outrageous and scandalous claim. In fact, Jimmy Carter, the former president was visiting Cuba and he made a, a point about going to, to visit those laboratories and he completely refuted it. But apparently Bolton's own staff were saying this is nonsense. But um, yeah, he, he had made it clear that Cuba was being lined up um, as a potential target. Uh, Bolton re, you know, re returns, the return of John Bolton um, under the Trump administration. And he comes up with a new slogan, the, um, the what was it? The, oh, the Troika of Tyranny. Thank you, the Troika of Tyranny. And that was Cuba, uh, Venezuela and Nicaragua. Yeah, just absolute lettuce for brains, that guy. And of course, I mean, his his legacy, as well as with uh, an, another just diseased Cretan, um, Mike Pompeo, right, right as they were exiting, is is it, uh, um, designating designating Cuba uh, uh, as a state state sponsor of terror is you know the, one of the last things that they were able to do, or or, or Pompeo, I should say, because Bolton had already gotten the sack. Um, I do want to mention. I, I thought this was interesting. The the part of your book, and I, I think. At the even at the very least, I highly encourage everybody's got to read it, buy it and read it. Um, but the 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 section on the kind of medical internationalism was probably the part of the book that when I started reading it, I was initially least interested in. Like it wasn't something that had popped to me because personally, I was I was interested in the plan, the market, the that sort of thing. But it was the only part of the book that actually did drive me to tears on several occasions because the. It, it just, it, it really is almost, be, it's ineffable. You know, it, it really is the, the, the solidarity that you, you find in those pages is extremely touching. It is extremely touching. Um, and it makes you really understand the, what's at stake in, in the Cuban socialist, um, you know, it, what, what, what it really means, you know, it, it, it's really, 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 touching it like it's hard hard to even hard to even put into words frankly um but let, let's i think we, we there's a couple more things that i wanted to talk about um right quick we, we because we've been we've been going pretty hard i guess for about an hour 30 now so i i wanted to talk to you about um two things um one is there is the Cuban response to uh, climate change, which I think is really fascinating. It might be the most important thing right now that's going on, period, because the, you know, the models that need to exist don't exist, frankly, across the globe. And Cuba's doing something very different. And that I am so fascinated by. And then I want to talk about the, um, was it day zero and the unification of the, uh, the two, the, the CUC and the CUP and the, uh, and that and all, all, all that stuff. So just to, to talk about the, um, the climate change stuff. So, you know, what the UN rolls out in 2015 sustainable development goals. And is it like, you know, Cuba is like the only one to hit them or something, right? Is that there's something like remarkable like this. And then, um, you know, in, in typical fashion, Cuba's model and their ability to do this stuff it can't be can't be touted it can't be recommended you know because it's su such a pariah um and you know the united states would never let it you know have it, its moment like that so could, could you talk a little bit about like what you know cuba has done and what makes them you know so special with regards to combating climate change as compared to say the again just total cretans in the united states uh, economists among them who simply you know oh market mechanisms will fix it all, you know, just let the market run it, and which has just been a total fucking failure heretofore. So yeah, it just that, that part of the book was really, really, really great. Okay, so um, I mean, there's so much to say here. Cuba was uh, the Living Planet Report of 2006 is the first that I'm aware of that identified Cuba at that point as the only country in the world achieving sustainable development. So it was improving the lives of its citizens because they're you know, still improving infant mortality and, and, and all those other indicators. And um, Cuba has high human development according to the um, 
UN's Human Development Index, um, and at the same time living within the carrying capacity of its ecosystem. So it was not destroying its ecosystem faster than it could uh, reproduce itself. So um, most reports, I think, that, well, all of the ones that I'm aware of that have, have measured, you know, those sorts of things have put Cuba, if not in front, in the, in the top countries. Some of them include GDP. So Cuba's gonna, um, uh, you know, fall with GDP. So it's fascinating that Cuba is in the so high up in the HDI, the Human Development Index, even though one third of that is measuring GDP. But um, uh, last year, was it last year, year before, Jason Hickel uh, developed a new uh, Sustainable Development Index, which removes the GDP component from measuring. Um, you know, from the HDI essentially. And as he points out, there's a correlation between the higher a GDP is and the more destructive an economy is uh, because the, you know, the production of high GDP is based on destruction of the environment essentially. And in that index, Cuba again um, comes out on top, is leading the world. So um, yeah, so Cuba's done it. How does it do it? It's not a highly industrialized country. It's not a consumer society. They um, were forced with the collapse of the Soviet bloc to make a very rapid and dramatic shift to organic farming, uh, to urban farming, to city gardens and all the rest of it. But they then embedded that in their development model. So it became a part of the constitution of the Small Farmers Association that they were, um, one of their objectives was sustainable development. It became illegal to use chemicals in, um, in organiponicos, which is uh, urban farming. And um, they, they took it on as a principle. Now, you know, there is an argument that says, oh, Cuba is only good with that because they had to. But as someone has pointed out, and I think I quote this in the book, if you took that logic and said, oh, Cuba's only leading in sustainable development because it's poor, then why, you know, how can you explain the environmental destruction in Haiti, right, which is the poorest, possibly the poorest country in the hemisphere. So, you know, the fact is they had scientists already training and committed to making this shift to non-chemical fertilizers, to biofertilizers and, and um and organic agriculture. And the same happens with uh, renewable energies. I mean, I found out from my book, you've, you'll have read, there's a chapter on the energy revolution. Incredibly, they had the physics department at the University of Havana was already working on building solar panels in 1968. That was so ahead of the game. Um, but it's also true while they had, you know, people who were enthusiastic and behind it in the scientific capacity, they didn't have the imperative to do it because they were receiving huge investment, uh, huge amounts of very low priced oil from the Soviet Union. But it meant that they had, you know, they had the commitment, they had the scientists there. And that's what you see a pattern playing out when conditions change, they have the capacity. So it's the two things is, is you know, having the necessity, yes, the necessity was there with the shift away from uh, fertilizers and, and the so-called green revolution tractor base and all the rest of it, the necessity, but also the capacity. And that's what Cuba's so good at. Um, so in terms of, I, I'll tell you a bit about the climate change because I'm starting to do some work on this now. Um, Cuba has, a long-term state plan to confront climate change. That's what it's called, it's, called, it's literally called. But it, the, the, the name it's known by is Tarea Vida, life task. Because they have said, as you have said, this is probably the biggest problem. I think, I, I agree, I think COVID is the biggest immediate short-term problem, short-term in a historical sense. Uh, but behind, you know, beyond that, it's definitely climate change. So Cuba is a small Caribbean island. It's the largest island in the Caribbean. They are responsible for 0.02% of global warming. And yet they're in you know, the front line for countries that are facing existential threat. Um, they predict that by the end of the century, they'll lose 122 coastal towns. You know, with rising seawaters, um, it's not just that the, the water goes in, it also, uh, you have a problem of salination. So their water reserves 
are you know going to be affected the kind of um, parasites and, and 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 plagues that they'll expect from the weather change i mean the, I, i've read up on the predictions that the cuban scientists are making and how these changes will impact and it is scary it is really genuinely scary now what can cuba do because they're not responsible for polluting the world right but what they they can do is they have to adapt their, their their environment, their population and their lived environment to be able to withstand, to have that resilience, yeah? So the um, Terrea Vida is a hundred year projection of projects and plans for adapting to uh, climate change. So they have the, the short term, which was 2020, so that's already gone, the... Um, medium term, long term and very long term, which takes us up to 2100. <laughs> and, um, you know, they're already they're already working at it. But the, the basis, like everything, like we were talking about the consultations of the documents for economic changes, it's based on bringing the community with you. So they have um, fishing villages where that village is, is going to get, you know, flooded soon but they're working but wait before it gets to emergency point they're working with those families that have been there in generations they feel really attached to to that spot and they're trying to you know get their agreement that they have to move inland and so they rebuild they're already rebuilding coastal villages inland and then using things like mangrove natural protections and so on to to um mitigate the impact. So it, it is incredible, and it's some it's an area of work. I'm just I've just written a book chapter um, about it, but that's more charting the sort of historical development. Because like every area of Cuba, I look at when I, I look back and I say, well, hold on a minute, they set up an environmental committee in 1972 to lead work on this, and in fact, their constitution of 1976, the first constitution introduced, has environmental protections included it's one of the first in the world to um to talk about the environment so you know they they are um so ahead of the game in so many of these areas there was a you know a part of the book where one, one of the I actually have th th three things just to mention about this because I, yeah uh, there's a part of the book where and i don't remember who said it but one of the kind of officials talking about the environment you know, basically says right now um you know we have to look at just as you said it, you know, uh, prevention measures or, or sort of measures of triage looking forward to the environment. And it really just goes to show just how realistic. I mean, I feel like a lot of, I can't think of um, in the United States, um, any real effort to think about the amount of people who are going to be displaced and destroyed, you know, just with, with however many, um, you know, uh, metrics of the uh, of water rising, you know what I mean? And I think like, you know, you have a, a party that, you know, it was just in power that either doesn't think it's real or thinks that, you know, what happens happens and basically has almost a nonchalant idea. I mean, it's miraculously nefarious. Um, and there's a part of the movie, um, which I also recommend, please, please go watch the movie um, that uh, Helen made about COVID-19 in Cuba. It's very good. Where one of the medical professionals uh, that you interview or uh, that was interviewed said, um, you know, believe in science, trust in scientists, which was which was almost a little funny to hear because that had been a big part of that, just th that phrase had been a huge part of kind of Biden's campaign and like American liberals always talking about believe the scientists and stuff. And you never really get the impression that in the United States they're very serious about it, you know, because the if you do trust the scientists on shit like climate change, then you, you know, the only thing that you really can conclude is that there has to be economic planning yesterday and socialism yesterday. It's the only conclusion that you could possibly have. You know, so it's really funny hearing someone, uh, you know, a Cuban doctor talking about believe the scientists, because I believe him when he says that, you know, I don't believe liberals when they say believe the scientists, because the science says, you know, <laughs> the science almost says read Marx, you know, when it comes to climate change. That's that's what I, you know, when I, when I read the, the you know, the the um, IPCC report, I mean, they, they say, you know, you have to have big drastic social economic changes, you know a revolution in other words now <laughs> you know right now is what they're saying it's remarkable uh the problem is that the profit motive right cannot accommodate 
externalities it doesn't matter what they say right and you know it shouldn't be externalities but the the impact that production has on the environment and consumption has on the environment they cannot be factored into a profit seeking system why because it will undermine profit so you know why do we see cuba leaving because it's a socialist model that means that the the, the purpose of production and distribution and consumption is welfare. Human beings can't live abstracted from their environment, right? Now that doesn't mean that socialism automatically produces good outcomes for the environment because it hasn't always. It means that, you know, you talked about Trump, Trump's administration either didn't believe it or they don't care. You know, they're being led by by capitalist interests, that is short term shareholders, you know, they don't even think to the next, you know, they don't not think thinking 10 years ago that uh, away, they may be thinking to the next election, you know, and they're thinking about the corporate jobs, the corporate boards they're going to sit on when they finish being politicians. Yeah, this is also the critique of the model that we have. Yeah, it's about um, elite accessing as much benefit as they can while they've got the leverage but it's not there's no long-term vision about about welfare here and so you have to remove the profit motive if you're going to find a way of organizing society and making sure that you know everyone has what they need for a decent standard of living while um, not destroying the environment, while recognizing that we can't exist without our environments. Yeah, and, and just uh, in, in interest of, of sort of like getting sort towards like a takeaways from our conversation today. Um, I mean, I think the one thing like from reading your book and, and hearing you speak, the one thing that socialists can learn from Cuba today is that, you know, we need to meet necessity, not with nihilism, but uh, a, a, look, a vision of a human community. That's the only way that we're going to be able to overcome the crises we're facing today. And on that, right, human communities are complicated and diverse. We need democracy, you know? We need um, to open movements up for uh, people to participate, for everyone to have the right to, uh, to platforms and to, you know, their literature and all the rest of it. I think that's really important. We have a very, very divisive movement and there's um, too much of people protecting their privileges. Well, I think we can conclude now. Um, I just want to offer a totally robust and heartfelt thanks to Dr. Helen Yaffa for joining us. This, this has been like... I've been looking forward to this for so long and I'm, I'm just overjoyed that we were able to have this discussion. Um, Helen is a super busy woman, which is wonderful because she's doing more than anybody that I know of to dispel not only the disgusting and shitty things that have been, that, that have been said about Cuba in, the, in this country and in the West for a very long time, but also to bring a really level-headed and accurate analysis of that country um, not only to socialists, but to the, 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 the press in general, which is a huge, huge thing for us. I think it's, it's a really big deal to have a country like Cuba taken seriously, and it means a lot to our movement in general, you know. And so I want to, to thank you for that um, from the bottom of my heart, for sure. And, you know, anytime you want to come on to talk about anything, we'll be ha so happy to have you. Um, thank you so, so much. Thank you for the invite. I just want to repeat, because you said about the documentary, it's available on YouTube for everyone to watch. It's called Cuba and COVID-19, Public Health, Science and Society. Is that it? No, Science and Solidarity. Because <laughs> <laughs> it, ha it has, the, as you say, the interview with the doctor who went to Lombardy in Italy yeah. to combat COVID-19. And thanks so much for the invite. I mean, I would like to have um, talked a little bit more about the Cuban vaccines, because it is an incredible story. I've got an article that's going to come out um, next week, so maybe you can share that anyway. Um, but, you know, Cuba now has five 
domestically produced vaccines for COVID-19 um, under clinical trials, two of them at phase three. This is a really big deal for Cuba. It's probable that Cuba would have really struggled to get vaccines produced by Big Pharma because of the cost and because of the US sanctions. And, you know, it's a really big deal for the global south because they know that Cuba will share their medical science innovations and they know it will be accessible, affordable. And, uh, you know, and, and as soon as the Cubans are in a position, they will, based on their internationalism, make that available for countries which, quite frankly, are at the bottom of the list. So um, maybe we can come on another time and talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Compa compared to what, you know, the United States who just waived the with the WHO, um, like internet intellectual property thing, right? They're, they're like the, the United States and the West is basically like, you're not getting this vaccine without ponying up, you know, uh, a really, really, really dirty, really dirty to play with the global health in the name of profit. I mean, it's sends chills down your spine, frankly, you know. Yeah. Well, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism has been publishing some reports about Pfizer uh, actually bullying Argentina and Brazil, making them put up national assets like embassies as collateral in case there is any future legal case to put that in the contract. I mean, it is, un well, it's not unbelievable. We, we believe it because we know, we know what they're really about. Really. Yeah. Yeah. All too believable, really. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Thank you very much for having me on. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, so, you much. so much. It was a pleasure. <laughs>